Well, good morning, Bradley Elementary. It's Mr. Saxton, and we are here with some more Mr. Saxton Reads. We've got Harry Potter, all right? And so he has just gone to uh, uh, the Leaky Cauldron, um, and he's been recognized as a hero, and he's met Professor Quirrell, okay? So um, away we go. But the others wouldn't let Professor Quirrell keep Harry to himself. It took almost 10 minutes to get away from them all. At last, Hagrid managed to make himself heard over the babble. <clears throat> Must get on, lots to buy. Come on, Harry. Doris Crockford shook Harry's hand one last time, and Hagrid led them through the bar and out into a small walled courtyard where there was nothing but a dustbin and a few weeds. Hagrid grinned at Harry. Told you, eh, didn't I? Told you you was famous. Even Professor Quirrell was trembling to meet you. Mind you, he's usually trembling. Is he always that nervous? Oh, yeah, poor bloke. Brilliant mind. He was fine while he was studying out of books. But then he took a year off to get some first-hand experience. They say he met vampires in the Black Forest, and there was a nasty bit of trouble with a hag. Never been the same since. Scared of the students, scared of his own subject now. Where's me umbrella? Vampires, hags, Harry's head was swimming. Hagrid, meanwhile, was counting bricks in the wall above the dustbin. Three up, two across, he muttered. Right, stand back, Harry. And he tapped the wall three times with the point of his umbrella. The brick he had touched quivered. It, it wriggled, and in the middle, a small hole appeared. It grew wider and wider, and a second later, they were facing an archway, large enough even for Hagrid an archway on to a cobbled street with twisted and turned out of sight. Welcome, said Hagrid, to Diagon Alley. He grinned at Harry's amazement. They stepped through the archway. Harry looked quickly over his shoulder, and here they are. You can see that there. Harry looked quickly over his shoulder and saw the archway shrink instantly back into solid wall. The sun shone brightly on a stack of cauldrons outside the nearest shop. Cauldrons, all sizes, copper, brass, pewter, silver, self-stirring, collapsible, said a sign hanging over them. Yeah, you'll be needing one, said Hagrid, but we gotta get your money first. Harry wished he had about eight more eyes. He turned his head in every direction as they looked, as they walked up the street, trying to look at everything at once. The shops, the things outside them, the people doing their shopping. A plump woman outside an apothecary was shaking her head as they passed, saying, Dragon liver, 16 sickles an ounce, they're mad. A low, soft hooting came from a dark shop with a sign saying, Ilops Owl Emporium, Tawny Screech, Barn Brown and Snowy. Several boys about Harry's age had their noses pressed against the window with broomsticks in it. Look, Harry heard one of them say, the new Nimbus 2000, fastest ever. There were shops selling robes, shops selling telescopes and strange silver instruments Harry had never seen before. Windows stacked with barrels of bat spleens and eels' eyes, tottering piles of spell books, quills and rolls of parchment, potions, bottles, globes of the moon. Gringotts, said Hagrid. They had reached a snowy white building which towered over the other little shops. Standing beside its burnished bronze doors, wearing a uniform of scarlet and gold, was... Yeah, that's a goblin, said Hagrid quietly as they walked up the white stone steps toward him. The goblin was about a head shorter than Harry. He had a swarthy, clever face, a pointed beard, and Harry noticed very long fingers and feet. There's some more of Diagon Alley. He bowed as they walked inside. Now they were facing a second pair of doors, silver this time, with words engraved upon them. Enter, stranger, but take heed of what awaits the sin of greed. For those who take but do not earn must pay most dearly in their turn. So if you seek beneath our floors a treasure that was never yours, thief, you have been warned, beware of finding more than treasure there. Look, I said you'd be mad to try and rob it, said Hagrid. A pair of goblins bowed them through the silver doors and they were in a vast marble hall. About a hundred more goblins were sitting on high stools behind a large, long counter, scribbling in large ledgers, weighing coins on brass scales, examining precious stones through eyeglasses. 
There were too many doors to count leading off the hall, and yet more goblins were showing people in and out of these. Hagrid and Harry made for the counter. Morning, said Hagrid to a free goblin. We've come to take some money out of Harry Potter's safe. You have his key, sir. Got it here somewhere, said Hagrid, and he started emptying his pockets onto the counter, scattering a handful of moldy dog biscuits over the goblin's book of numbers. The goblin wrinkled his nose. Harry watched the goblin on their right, weighing a pile of rubies as big as glowing coals. Got it, said Hagrid at last, holding up a tiny golden key. The goblin looked at it closely. That seems to be in order. And I've got a letter here from Professor Dumbledore, said Hagrid, importantly throwing it in his chest. It's about the you-know-what in Vault 713. The goblin read the letter carefully. Very well, he said, handing it back to Hagrid. I will have someone take it down to both vaults. Griphook! Griphook was yet another goblin. Once Hagrid had crammed all the dog biscuits back inside his pockets, he and Harry followed Griphook toward one of the doors leading off the hall. What's the you-know-what in Vault 713? Harry asked. Well, can't tell you that, said Hagrid mysteriously. Very secret. Hogwarts business. Dumbledore trusted me. More than my job's worth to tell you that. Griphook held the door open for them. Harry, who had expected more mobble, was surprised. They were in a narrow stone passageway lit with flaming torches. It sloped steeply downwards, and there were little railway tracks on the floor. Griphook whistled, and a small cart came hurtling up the tracks toward them. They climbed in, haggard with some difficulty, and were off. At first, they were just hurtled through a maze of twisting passages. Harry tried to remember left, right, right, left, middle, fork, right, left, but it was impossible. The rattling cart seemed to know its own way because Griphook wasn't steering. Harry's eyes stung as the cold air rushed past them, but he kept them wide open. Once he thought he saw a burst of fire at the end of a passage and twisted around to see if it was a dragon, but too late. They plunged even deeper, passing an underground lake where huge stalactites and stalagmites grew from the ceiling and floor. Oh, I never know, Harry called to Hagrid over the noise of the difference of the cart. What's the difference between a stalagmite and a stalactite? Stalagmite's got an E a minute, said Harry. And don't ask me questions now. I think I'm going to be sick. He did look very green. And when the cart stopped at last beside a small door in the passage wall, Hagrid got out and had to lean against the wall to stop his knees trembling. Griphook unlocked the door. A lot of green smoke came billowing out, and as it cleared, Harry gasped. Inside were mounds of gold coins, columns of silver, heaps of little bronze nuts. All yours, smiled Hagrid. All oh, Harry's. It was incredible. The Dursleys couldn't have known about this, or they'd have had it from him faster than blinking. How often had they complained how much Harry cost them to keep, and all the time there had been a small fortune belonging to him, buried deep under London. Hagrid helped Harry pile some of it into a bag. The gold ones are galleons, he explained. 17 silver sickles to a galleon and 29 canuts to a sickle. It's easy enough. Right, that should be enough for a couple of terms and we'll keep the rest safe. He turned to Griphook. Vault 713 now, please. And can we go more slowly? One speed only, said Griphook. There's a goblin. They were going even deeper now and gathering speed. The air became colder and colder as they hurled around tight corners. They went rattling over an underground ravine and Harry leant over the side to try and see what was down at the dark bottom, but Hagrid groaned and pulled him back by the scruff of his neck. Vault 713 had no key hook. Keyhole. Stand back, said Griphook importantly and he stroked the door gently with one of his long fingers, and it simply melted away. If anyone but a Gringotts goblin tried that, they'd be sucked through the door and trapped in there, said Griphook. How often do you check to see if anyone's inside? Harry asked. About every once every ten years, said Griphook with a rather nasty grin. Something really extraordinary had to be inside this top security vault. Harry was sure and he leant forward eagerly, expecting to see fabulous jewels at the very least. But at first he thought it was empty. Then he noticed a grubby little package 
wrapped up in brown paper lying on the floor. Haggard picked it up and tucked it deep inside his coat. Harry longed to know what it was, but he knew better than to ask. Come on back in this infernal cart and don't talk to me on my way back. It's best if I keep my mouth shut, said Hagrid. One wild cart ride later, they stood blinking in the sunlight outside Gringotts. Harry didn't know where to run first, now they had a bag full of money. He didn't have to know how many galleons there were to a pound to know he was holding more money than he'd ever had in his whole life, more money than even Dudley had ever had. Might as well get your uniform, said Hagrid, nodding towards Madame Malkin's robes for all occasions. Listen, Harry, would you mind if I slipped off for a pick-me-up in the leaky cauldron? I hate them Gringotts carts. He did still look a bit sick, so Hagry entered Madam Malkin's shop alone, feeling nervous. Madam Malkin was a squat, smiling wretch, dressed all in mauve. Hogwarts, dear, she said when Harry started to speak. Got the law here, another young man being fitted up just now, in fact. In the back of the shop, a boy with pale face was standing on a footstool while a second witch pinned up his long black robes. Madam Malkin stood Harry on a stool next to him and slipped a long robe over his head and began to pin it to the right length. Hello, said the boy. Hogwarts too? Yes, said Harry. My father's next door buying my books and mother's up the street looking at wands. That is Draco Malfoy. They don't get along very well said the boy in a bored, drawling voice. Then I'm going to drag them off to look at racing brooms. I don't see why the first years can't have their own. I think I'll bully father into getting me one and I'll smuggle it in somehow. Harry was strongly reminded of Dudley. Have you got your own broom? The boy went on. No, said Harry. Play Kip Quidditch at all? No, said Harry again, wondering what on earth Quidditch could be. I do. Father says it's a crime if I'm not picked to play for my house and I must agree. No wet house you'll be in yet. No, said Harry, feeling more stupid by the minute. Well, no one really knows until they get there, do they? But I know I'll be in Slytherin. All our family have been. Imagine being in Hufflepuff. I think I'd leave, wouldn't you? Hmm, said Harry, wishing he could say something a bit more interesting. Oh, I say, look at that man, said the boy, suddenly nodding towards the front window. Hagrid was standing there, grinning at Harry and pointing at two large ice creams to show he couldn't come in. That's Hagrid, said Harry. He works at Hogwarts. Oh, said the boy, I've heard of him. He's a sort of a servant, is he? He's the gamekeeper, said Harry. He was liking the boy less and less every second. Yes, exactly. I heard he's sort of savage. Lives in a hut in the school grounds, and every now and then he gets drunk, tries to do magic, and ends up setting fire to his bed. Oh, I think he's brilliant, said Harry, coldly. Do ya, said the boy with a slight sneer. Why is he with you? Where are your parents? They're dead, said Harry shortly. He didn't feel much like going into the matter with this boy. Oh, sorry, said the other, not sounding sorry at all. But they were our kind, weren't they? They were a witch and a wizard, if that's what you mean. I really don't think they should let the other sort in, do you? They're just not the same. They've never been brought up to know our ways. Some of them have never even heard of Hogwarts until they get a letter. Imagine. I think they should keep it in the old wizarding families. What's your surname, anyway? But before Harry could answer... Madam Malkin said, That's you, Dunn, my dear. And Harry, not sorry for an excuse to stop talking to the boy, hopped down from the footstool. Well, I'll see you at Hogwarts, I suppose, said the drawling boy. Harry was rather quiet as he ate the ice cream Hagrid had brought him, chocolate and raspberry with chopped nuts. What's up? said Hagrid. Nothing, Harry lied. And they stopped to buy parchment and quills. Harry cheered up a bit when he found a bottle of ink that changed color as you wrote. When they had left the shop, he said, Hagrid, what's Quidditch? Blimey, Harry, I keep forgetting how little you know, not knowing about Quidditch. Don't make me feel worse, said Harry. He told Hagrid about the pale boy and Madame Malkins. And he said people from Muggle families shouldn't even be allowed in. Ah, you're not up from a Muggle family. If he'd have known who you were, he'd grown up knowing your name if his parents are wizard and folk. You saw him in the leaky cauldron. Anyway, what does he know about it? Some of the best I ever saw were the only ones with magic in them in a long line of muggles. Look at your mum. Look at what she had for a sister. So what is Quidditch? It's our sport, wizard sport. It's like, like football in the muggle world. Everyone follows Quidditch. Play it up in the air on broomsticks and there's four balls. Sort of hard to explain the rules. In what are Slytherin and Hufflepuff? 
schoolhouses, there's four. Everyone says Hufflepuff or a lot of duffers, but oh, I bet I'm in Hufflepuff, said Harry gloomily. Better Hufflepuff than Slytherin, said Hagrid darkly. Not a single witch or wizard who went bad who wasn't in Slytherin. You know who was one. Vole, sorry, you know who was at Hogwarts? Years and years ago, said Hagrid. They brought, they bought Harry's school books in a shop called Flourish and Bots, where the shelves were stacked to the ceiling with books as large as paving stones bound in leather, books the size of postage stamps and covers of silk, books full of peculiar symbols, and a few books with nothing in them at all. Even Dudley, who never read anything, would have been wild to get his hands on some of these. Hagrid almost had to drag Harry away from curses and counter curses. Bewitch your friends and befuddle your enemies with the latest revenges, hair loss, jelly legs, tongue tying, and much, much more. By Professor Vindictus Viridian. I was trying to find out how to curse Dudley. Well, I'm not saying that's a good idea, but you're not to use your magic in the Mughal world, except in very special circumstances, said Hagrid. And anyway, you couldn't work any of them curses yet. You'll need a lot more study before you get to that level. Hagrid wouldn't let Harry buy a solid gold cauldron either. It says pewter on your list, but they got a nice set of scales for weighing potion ingredients and a collapsible brass telescope. Then they visited the apothecary, which was fascinating enough to make up for its horrible smell. A mixture of bad eggs and rotted cabbage. Barrels of slimy stuff stood on the floor, jars of herbs, dried roots and bright powders lined the walls. Bundles of feathers, strings of fangs, and snarled claws hung from the ceiling, while Hagrid asked the man behind the counter for a supply of some basic potion ingredients for Harry. Harry himself examined silver unicorn horns at 21 galleons each, and minuscule, glittery, black beetle eyes, five canuts a scoop. Outside the apothecary, Hagrid checked Harry's list again. I just your one left, oh yeah, and I still haven't gotten you a birthday present. Harry felt himself go red. You don't have to. Oh, I know. I don't have to. Tell you what, I'll get your animal. Not a toad. Toads went out of fashion years ago. You'd be laughed at, and I don't like cats. They make me sneeze. I'll get your an owl. All the kids want owls. They're dead useful, carrying your post and everything. 20 minutes later, they left Ilop's alum horn, which had been dark and full of rustling and flickering jewel bright eyes. Harry now carried a large cage, with which held a beautiful snowy owl. Fast asleep with her head under her wing. He couldn't stop stammering his thanks, sounding just like Professor Quirrell. Don't mention it, said Hagrid gruffly. Don't expect you get a lot of presents from them Dursleys. Just Ollivander's left now, only place for wands, Ollivander's, and you gotta have the best wand. A magic wand? This was what Harry had been really looking forward to. The last shop was narrow and shabby, peeling gold letters over the door, read Ollivander's, makers of fine wands since 382 BC. A single wand lay on a faded purple cushion in the dusty window. A tinkling bell rang somewhere in the depths of the shop as they stepped inside. It was a tiny place, empty except for a single spindly chair which Hagrid sat on to wait. Harry felt strangely as though he had entered a very strict library. He swallowed a lot of new questions which had just occurred to him and looked instead at the thousands of narrow boxes piled neatly right up to the ceiling. For some reason, the back of his neck prickled. The very dust and silence in her seemed to tingle with some secret magic. Good afternoon, said a soft voice. Harry jumped. Hagrid must have jumped, too, because there was a loud crunching noise and he got quickly off the spindling chair. An old man was standing before them, his wide, pale eyes shining like moons through the gloom of the shop. Hello, said Harry awkwardly. Ah, oh, yes, said the man. Yes, yes, I thought I'd be seeing you soon, Harry Potter. It wasn't a question. You have your mother's eyes. It seems only yesterday she was in here buying herself her first wand. Ten and a quarter inches swishy made of willow. Nice wand for charm work. Mr. Ollivander moved closely to Harry. Harry wished he could blink. Those silvery eyes were a bit creepy. Your father, on the other hand, favored a mahogany wand, 11 inches pliable, a little more power and excellent for transfiguration. Well, I say your father favored it. It's really the wand that chooses the wizard, of course. Mr. Ollivander had come so close that he and Harry were almost nose to nose. Harry could see himself reflected in those misty eyes. And that's where Mr. Ollivander touched the lightning scar on Harry's forehead with a long white finger. 
I'm sorry to say I sold the wand that did it, he said softly. 13 and a half inches, you, powerful wand, very powerful and in the wrong hands. Well, if I'd known what the wand was going out into the world to do. He shook his head and then to Harry's relief spotted Hagrid. Rubius, Rubius, Hagrid, how nice to see you again. Oak, 16 inches, rather bendy, wasn't it? It was, sir, yes, said Hagrid. Good wand, that one, but I suppose they snapped it in half when you got expelled, said Mr. Ollivander, suddenly stern. Arr, yes, they did, yes, said Hagrid, shuffling his feet. I still got the pieces, though, he added brightly. But you don't use them, said Mr. Ollivander sharply. Oh, no, sir, said Hagrid quickly, and Harry noticed as he gripped his pink umbrella very tightly as he spoke. Hmm, said Mr. Ollivander, giving Hagrid a piercing look. Well, now, Mr. Potter, let me see. And he pulled a long tape measure with silver markings out of his pocket. Which is your wand arm? Er, well, I'm right-handed, said Harry. Hold out your arm, that's it. And he measured Harry from shoulder to finger, then wrist to elbow, shoulder to floor, knee to armpit, and round his head. And as he measured, he said, Every Ollivander wand has a core of a powerful magical substance, Mr. Potter. We use unicorn hairs, phoenix tail feathers, and the heartstrings of dragons. And we're going to stop there. There's a picture of a wand on a purple pillow. So we'll be back at 1.30 today with more of Harry Potter. Stay strong. Stay Bradley strong. Go Bears.